All right, now we should be live. <laughs> it's been a bit of a challenge today to get this going, so let's see uh, if I show up on here. There we go. <clears throat> Turn volume down. All right. Uh, apparently when I scheduled this, it did it as unlisted, so Sorry for you all if you're showing up now and you don't didn't realize that we were having a live stream, uh, but uh, it is happening right now. So anyway, sorry for anybody who didn't know about that and has to watch this later, but um, uh, we are live now. All right, cool. And it is showing up on my iPad over here, so I do have the ability to check chat over here. So... Uh, I was wondering why nobody was waiting. <laughs> Not that I expect that people have to be waiting for me to start the live stream. But usually somebody is. And it's a Saturday, so people aren't at work. So I thought, hey, somebody's going to be uh, somebody's gonna be waiting. But nobody was. But that's because I had it listed uh, as unlisted. Hey, Seth. At least somebody's here. <laughs> uh, the, the fails of YouTube. Actually, what happened is I scheduled the live stream. Uh, I did all the details uh, and sh scheduled it as public, and uh, you have to change a bunch of things that are set as default that aren't normally set that way, and then it wouldn't work, so then I had to start all over again, and I forgot to hit the uh, public notification, so I've had this scheduled for like two and a half hours, uh, and I just had to go live without actually having uh, uh, public, um, you know, without having it known ahead of time, so sorry about that. Um, but I told you all that I would probably have, uh, um, a heads up that I was going to be live and which I did today, but, uh, it didn't work. So, and then I started the live stream two other times. Uh, yes, I do need a marketing social media team, Seth. Um, if you're, if you're, uh, uh applying for the job, it pays, um, in pottery. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so we've got, uh, Let's see. Welcome you all. Hey, Shelly, how are you? Uh, we've got uh, Sherry, Eve, cunt, uh, Country Potter. Oh, Jerry Beaumont. Hey, Jerry. I hope you're doing well. Um, we have uh, Seth, of course. Mary, Cynthia, Lori. Thank you all for being here. Oh, California. So, uh, all right, deal. All right, sounds good, Seth. You're, 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 you're on the payroll for clay now, or for pottery. Anyway, I, uh, I didn't know exactly what I was going to throw today. I have a few jugs that I just made because I need to make a couple more face jugs. Uh, I need to make a couple more cabin jugs. So maybe we'll start out and show you guys uh, what I'm talking about. So I uh, this is the last face jug I just made recently. I just posted about that on Instagram recently. And I've got these cabin jugs here. Uh, and I've got a couple more in the back. But... Um, uh, here's the jugs that I just got done throwing uh, a little bit ago before I live streamed. Got done throwing those and realized it was it was uh, uh, five minutes till four when I was supposed to to uh, when I was supposed to go live. So anyway, uh, that's what uh, that's the jugs I was making and what I plan to do with them. I do need to make another. Uh, I had my first two face jug that I made last fall. Um, and it uh, had a smiling face on one side and a kind of sinister face with a forked tongue on the other side. And I called it my politician jug. Uh, it was probably one of the first jugs I sold. Uh, so I need to make another one of those, but I, I really need to be inspired to do that. So we'll see if one of those turns into another politician jug. But um, either way, we're going to throw some pots. I thought that I would throw something interesting for you guys. I... Uh, have you thrown teeny tiny pots, Pam? No, I have not. Um, I don't. I don't know that I would enjoy that. Um, but uh, yeah, I've thought about uh, playing around with one of those little bitty wheels. They make these little bitty wheels. They have like a, a couple inch wheel head on them. But no, I have not. Um, so anyway, um, oh, Seth says a cabin mug, so you can drink out of one. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Uh, let's see. The uh, cabin mugs, espresso shot cups. Gotcha. Uh, uh, espresso. Sorry, I said espresso. My bad. 
Um, but anyway, I'm going to make a couple. Uh, the last firing I made, uh, the first time I'd made like a squared baking dish. And so I'm going to make a few of those. Uh, it's something that I make kind of like what I call a brownie pan. It's like uh, I take a normal kind of like pie plate looking shape and then I flatten two sides of it to, uh, or all four sides of it to make a, uh, a uh, squared baking dish and I put two handles on opposite sides so that you could hold it. Uh, so I've got four pounds of clay over here. I've got uh, uh, three clay balls cut up already uh, and I'm just going to make a couple of those to start with and we'll talk about uh, uh, how I do these, uh, the inspiration, where they came from and you guys can ask questions and and uh or talk about whatever you'd like to and if you have any uh things that you would like to see me make you can uh put that in the chat but i'm gonna i'm gonna face this down so that you can see what i'm doing here we'll get that uh get that a little closer so i don't have to look at my chat on my phone i can kind of set that up so that you guys can see from that angle over there Oh, Pam, those little wheels are harder than full size. I'm sure they are. I can't. I I, I would probably have a hard time because my hands are not teeny tiny. Uh, not that they're giant, but uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I assume I'd have to use a lot of tools. So. Have I ever made espresso cups? Uh, I made some. I made some, uh, what I called a Demitasse cup, which is, is, I guess, basically like a half size cup. I made some of those that could have been used as espresso cups, I assume, but uh, that's probably the closest I've made. Um, those were all gas fired. Uh, I've got one in the house, so. Do I ever work standing up? Yes, I, I do, and I, I did exclusively uh, for a long time. Um, well, Jerry, you know, I started at Holly Hill Pottery as far as my first job in pottery, and that's all they did. They didn't sit down to throw anything, and for years, that's all I did, and then, um, now I do, uh, I do a good portion, uh, maybe a little less than half of what I do. I do standing up, and to be honest with you, it usually goes by shape or the size of the things that I'm making that I will change. Um, this is probably a shape that I would normally make standing up, but uh, I was already at the wheel here sitting throwing those jugs, and I thought, okay, well, I'm not going to switch wheels now when I was running out of time to start the live stream, so. Yeah, Jerry, and we, we met uh, a few years ago down at Starworks when you were in town one time, and I got to tell you my story of how... Uh, my my remembering you throwing those large uh, umbrella stands and you had it completely dry on the outside and wet on the inside that that kind of taught me that I could I could throw without being sloppy wet on the inside and the outside of a piece so I uh, it's helped me tremendously in making my larger forms when I go to shape things to not use a ton of water and to uh, really on the outside especially throw without any water and, and very little if not just a little bit of slip on the inside so kind of the reverse of what you did but uh you tried an eight pound platter but it ended up more of a large bowl yeah well uh they can be challenging it can be tricky to make a a platter uh, or a platter bowl out of larger amounts of clay um if you make the bottom a little bit wider, it should help you a little bit. But uh, yeah, laying that out, uh, getting a, a, a large piece, especially the more clay you use, getting that laid out uh, can be tricky. So without it falling, I should say. So there's a, a standard uh, uh, kind of a pie plate shape. So it does uh, angle uh, in from the top down to the bottom. I can give you some size measurements or some some size. Let's give you some measurements here. That's about eleven and a quarter wide, and about almost two and a half tall, um, out of four pounds of clay. So it's it's hefty. It's not super thin, but it's going to be used as a baking dish. So I'm not worried about that. And what I'm going to do now is take another one of my round bats, and I'm actually just going going to wet part of this so that it slides across the, the clay. Here, let 
I need to back my camera up a little bit. So I'm going to uh, wet this, and then I'm going to pick one side, and I'm actually just going to uh, hold it at an angle and push up until it touches the bottom, and then I'm going to stand it upright, and then I'm going to kind of just push that against the bat a little bit, and then lift straight up, and which is why the water's on there, so that it can slide up the side of the sidewall of the clay there. All right, now I'm gonna spin the wheel halfway around. I'm gonna do the other side, try to get it straight across from it. One way to do this is actually to use the bat pins for the first two, I should have done that. Uh, so that's a good way to center the, the, the walls from each other. But I'm pushing it against the bat just to kind of help reinforce the fact that it needs to be stay straight like that. Then I'm going to go to the other two sides and try to make it a squared form here. So there we go, now we have a, uh, a squared dish made on a round wheel, and then I'll come back later and add handles on two of the sides, like I said, so then you can be able to use it to, to get it out of the oven, uh, pick it up when it's hot, and so there you go, there's, there's one of those. I'll make another one of those now, and you can watch from start to finish on that. Oh, welcome from Papua New Guinea, candle holders, square and cylinder tumblers, old school jug. What? <laughs> oh, you're giving me ideas of what to throw. Okay, I was like, that wasn't a complete sentence, Seth. I didn't know what you were talking about. Gotcha. Yeah, candle holders, that's one thing that, uh, that uh, I don't know how well that would sell. Um, there's some things that I would like to make that I don't think would sell, and there's other things that I know would sell that I don't want to make. <laughs> so kind of two categories there that I, I try to stay away from if I can. Uh, I would I would more likely make things, I don't know, I'd probably more likely make things that I may not want to make that I know would sell than I would make something that I just want to make even though it wouldn't sell. Um, because I guess the practical side of things, the fact that in the end uh, I need to sell things to make a living and so if I made things that uh, I didn't want to make but would sell, that would be a little bit more practical, although less fun than making something I didn't want to, or that I did want to make that might not sell. But then in the end, if you make something that you wanted to make that didn't sell, and it didn't sell, you don't have much reason to make another one. Uh, not for the little candles, the big candles. Yeah, like, uh, like a pillar candle. I mean, not a pillar, but a, uh, yeah. Yeah, a pillar candle, not a taper candle. Yeah, I, I did make some pillar candle holders, and, uh, and they never really sold, so. <laughs> uh, you've been get uh, Jerry, so you know, you've been getting your bats from Lorianne at Ben Owen Pottery, yeah. Uh, these, actually, uh, I was just talking about them the other day. Uh, about a place that I could get bats because Ben told me Lorianne was making them. Um, these, I have, a, I have a fan of the YouTube channel that lives in St. Louis, and he was able to get a few sheets of this uh, tempered masonite, and so he's made me a few and didn't even let me pay him for them, so I've gotten, I, I have several bats that he made that were just free, uh, but they are the double-sided, smooth, tempered masonite. But I did think, okay, well, if I eventually have to buy some, then uh, then that would be the place to go to get them. So, and of course, being you when they use the laser cutter to to cut them, that would definitely make them very fit very well on your wheel. So, or should. How do you know the things <clears throat> you make won't sell unless you make them? 
That's a good question, uh, Renee. Uh, I mean, obviously, I don't know. Uh, some things I have made in the past and haven't sold. And so that kind of gives me an idea. Um, so, there, yeah, there's no guaranteed way of knowing what's going to sell unless you make it. Uh, obviously, I'm not... Uh, if I knew what, if I knew 100% what was going to sell and what wouldn't sell, then I, I should probably uh, be like trading stocks and not making pottery. But uh, um, obviously, I'm making pottery, not trading stocks. So, <laughs> but I have a, I have a good sense of, of things I've made uh, that do sell and things that I've made that haven't sold, and that's not always foolproof because sometimes somebody walks into your booth. Or into your shop and buys the very thing that you kind of like didn't think would sell or hasn't sold in forever and so you know you don't fully know uh, what's gonna sell and what's not gonna sell just experience I guess would be the best thing I can say um, all right so this time I'm gonna line it up with my uh, bat pins to give me a little bit more of a try to get it uh, directly across from each other is what I was trying to say. <clears throat> I make some test products if they don't uh, Oh, gotcha. Yeah, if they don't sell, take them and give them away. Yeah, trust me. There's there's been things that I've had that I've made that didn't sell, and then I just end up giving it away or or whatever, and that's fine. But uh, granted, if you're doing this as a hobby and not as a career, it's a whole lot easier to make things and just try them out. Then if you're trying to make a living at it, you kind of have to think, okay, well, I need to, uh, I kind of almost messed that up there, kind of hit the rim. Um, you kind of need to like, all right, well, if I think this will sell, then it'd be smarter to make. And if it's not going to sell, it'd be smarter not to make. Uh, obviously, like I said, there's no way to know that for sure, but... Yeah, this is a, a big apple pie for two dish. Uh, yeah, <laughs> apple pie for ten dish. I got gotcha. you. All right, there's another one of those. Maybe I'll I'll move the camera around and make the make one more and make it from a different angle so you can see another angle. Seth wants to see me make a Rebecca picture. I see that. <clears throat> Seth has one of the very few Rebecca pictures I've made in years that was uh, one shape that I desperately wanted to learn how to make when I was younger. And once I finally learned how to make them, I was like, I don't want to make these anymore. They're <laughs> extremely difficult. Uh, so I uh, haven't made any in years. I made one, wood-fired one. I think I made that one and said, man, now I know why I don't really want to make these because they're no fun. And so I didn't make it anymore. But Seth has one that I made. So, all right, let's see. There we go. Now y'all on the other side. Give y'all another angle at making the same piece. All right. Uh, after this one, I could uh, make something else if anybody else has any suggestions. I've got my list of of things to make for uh, this wood firing. Uh, obviously it's on my phone, so I don't have that in front of me at the moment, but that's the last time you've made them is wood fire one. <laughs> yeah, probably so, Seth. Maybe I'll make one in just a minute and then you get to see another one made. Hey Danny, welcome.
One thing I like to do when flattening out a large piece of clay like this is I like to use the heel of my hand. You'll see there when I push down in the center, it really helps to flatten the clay out. I have a, a, a you know a wide surface area that I'm pushing down on. I get to use the kind of the strength of my whole arm instead of just my fingertips. And it's a larger, flatter surface of part of my hand, uh, part of my hand that I can help make the bottom of the piece flat and wide like that. Sad, you have the son of the funny uh, Rebecca pitcher mug. I, that doesn't even work. You know, you're gonna pour it out of the spout into your mouth. <laughs> Seth probably, he would have an idea that probably would sell like crazy if, if I actually listened to him, though. I do have to make some face mugs this time, for sure, because I have a few people requesting them. A few people have a couple of orders I've taken that I need to fulfill, so i got to make some face mugs. Not doing that today, because, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't. Just throwing the mug is not going to be the fun part. Y'all watching me put the face on it would be the fun part, so maybe, maybe after I make some some of the mug forms and I'm going to put face on them, I'll do a live stream of that. But. All right, so there's the basic shape. Uh, again, uh, a 16 inch plate, that's a big plate. Uh, this is about 11 and a half. By about two and a half, so around the same size as that first one I made, just a hair bigger. All right, so now, like I said, I'm gonna take my bat, get some water on this portion of it down here, and I'm going to start right at that bat pin and raise it up and just kind of pull up like that so it flattens that side, and then I come back, put it, put the bat back there, and then push against the clay with my left hand and do that. Yeah, my first job in pottery, we, we made some what we call lasagna pans like this. We would kind of make this, this uh, similar shape to this. We would actually leave two ends of it round like this and flatten two ends and then we actually took a wire and cut off this vertical part here. Uh, but it was actually a remake of an old, old shape that uh, JB Cole Pottery made years ago. Um, and, uh, so that's where that idea came from, but. People always give me the look, uh, a Fu Manchu mug. Oh. Sorry, my the 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 heart is is covering up when I drink out of my Fu Manchu mug. Sorry, I was trying to read chat on my phone, and the 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 heart is covering up the last of your text uh, there, uh, Danny. Is that a mug that you made, or is that uh, or is that one I made? Sorry. So there we go. There's our 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 squared squared baking dish or brownie pan, as I called them. Obviously, you can cook whatever you want to in it, but uh, here's what the profile looks like. All right, let me grab uh, uh, some clay balls from over here. I gotta cut up a couple, and then I'll make, uh, I'll at least make one Rebecca picture for you, Seth. Uh, let me move the camera back over to this side. I can get some, uh, get some clay ready, and uh, you made the first one you sold, I, I thought, I bought from you in person, oh, okay. 
Gotcha. Got those clay balls cut up. Does anybody else come up with a suggestion here? We've got. Um, I'd love to see you make a candlestick if that's something you're interested in, Kathy. Uh, and then any tips on feeling the thickness and getting the clay to just the right thickness? Uh, do you suggest trimming extra clay or getting it figured out to start with? Um. I, I like to throw and get all the clay out instead of trimming, but that's personal. Uh, some people love to trim, and I see some people make some beautiful pots, uh, and they trim the heck out of the bottom, and they do that intentionally, and it doesn't make it any less of a pot, or them any less of a potter to do the trimming. Um, so I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but personally, I like to throw the pot so that I don't have to trim. That probably comes a lot from my production background as well as uh, just wanting to be efficient with my time and energy. So anyway, I've got about two pounds of clay here uh, to make a, uh, make a Rebecca pitcher. Uh, and Kathy, as far as the, the Rebecca, uh, I mean, uh, as far as a candlestick, is that something you'd like to see that holds a taper candle or something that holds uh, a pillar candle or both? Rebecca Pictures was, like I said, one of the first shapes that I really aspired to learn how to make. The pottery shop that I originally worked for when I started in pottery was kind of a combination of Holly Hill and J.B. Cole Pottery, which were two pretty traditional pottery shops in this area. And J.B. Cole, the Cole family, was really well known for their Rebecca Pictures. And uh, it was a pretty difficult shape to learn to make. And uh, I still make some shapes similar to it today, but a lot of times don't make a lot of times don't make them into Rebecca pitchers, but just make a vase form out of the same kind of basic shape. Uh, Sama says, "What are some tricks to throw in with raku clay? For example, when I add too much water, it doesn't hold up well." 
also cuts my hands. Yeah, uh, raccoon clay can be pretty groggy. Um, so, uh, I don't, the only raccoon clay I've ever messed with actually stood up very well. Uh, it was called Soldate uh, 60, I believe was the name of it. I can't remember who makes it, if it was High Water or who. Um, but a uh, Rebecca pitcher starts by tapering in at the base and then has a belly in the middle and then tapers in at the top again to a, uh, a skinny neck. And then the handle that goes on a Rebecca pitcher comes up from the top, makes like a loop, comes back down and connects to like the middle or top of the body of the of the piece. So that's kind of the uh, basic shape of the bottom there. I'm going to put a little rolled foot at the very base of it there. And now before I close in the top, I'm going to get that water out of the bottom right at the inside there. So now after making that kind of pedestal that it sits on, now I have to come back to the top and, and, uh, and close this in. And then basically make it into a pitcher with a, a skinny neck. Can you talk about what you're feeling as you pull? Yeah, I will, I'll have to do that on the next one. But uh, yeah, sorry, I, I was focused and didn't uh, didn't see your comment there. Uh, there's lots of uh, versions of uh, Rebecca pitchers out there. Uh, some have a very wide neck. Some have a very skinny neck. Um, so um, just depends on who was making it, their version of it. So I'd say that's kind of the basic starting shape of a, of a Rebecca pitcher, uh, at least ones that I was familiar with. Uh, and then you take basically the top here, I'm going to make a pitcher spout on one side and then the other side would be dented in and the handles would come up, make kind of a loop like this and back down and attach somewhere on the top kind of the, of the shoulder there. But I'm going to start it and just make a little spout on this side. So there's the spout, and then right behind the spout, I'm going to push in behind the spout and make a spot where the handle's going to attach. So the handle will attach here, come up and down to there. Uh, I think I have an older one uh, up here on my mantle. I can show you, or my mantle, my, uh, one of my shelves up here that I can show you that was made by Wayman Cole. So here's a Rebecca picture that was made by Wayman Cole. Um, so you can kind of get an idea of what I was going for there. This one wasn't really pushed in as much at the back and probably not as much of a, 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 a pinch there. And also uh, my got a little bit more curve at the base of mine than this one does, but you get the idea. Uh, yeah, why is it called a Rebecca Pitcher? Yeah, my, uh, my, uh, what I know of them as well is, is from the Bible as well, at least what I've heard, uh, kind of like what they would use to dip down into like a well to get water out and hold on to that handle at the top. I 
All right, let's see. Uh, what is the weather like in Seagrove in June, July? Is it still like a... I still like to plan a trip there and visit. Yeah, uh, John, it is It is usually pretty warm. Uh, we usually fire my wood kiln around the beginning of July, uh, and it's a pretty hot one usually. It just depends. Uh, well, anybody from North Carolina will tell you it could be anything because we've had, we've had freezing weather this year, and then we've had days where it was 65 to 70 degrees, uh, and it's still winter, so you just... Never really know, <laughs> but we are we, we we are pretty well known for our warm summer summers. So that's that's almost a guarantee, but almost. All right. Even though I don't really like making candlesticks, I will make one. Um, I'll make one that uh, could hold a taper and a pillar. That way it could kind of satisfy both. I know Kathy asked for one that would hold a taper. Now granted, I don't know the exact size and width of a taper candle, um, but I'll get it close. So I'm gonna throw this with a fairly wide base. I'm gonna I'm gonna taper I'm gonna taper it in like this, and then it's gonna have a wider top on it that can hold the pillar candle, but then also have a smaller hole in the center that can hold the uh, taper. As far as, uh, it's, it's, I guess it's kind of hard probably to explain what I'm feeling as I'm pulling because uh, I've done it so long. Uh, a lot of that is very unique to each person. Um, I will tell you the, the key to pulling well is matching the speed and pressure uh, to not only the, the speed of the wheel, uh, like as far as the speed of how fast you're moving up the clay with your hands, match that to the speed of the wheel uh, going around as well as to the th stiffness of the clay. Because some clay, if it's stiffer, you're, you're going to have to press a little harder. If it's softer, you may have to ease up on that pressure. And that's going to be an individual feeling per, like, Per person and per the clay that you're using at that time so all right so now I'm going to take this kind of wide taper and I'm going to, I'm going to pinch this in to make a Now I'm not. I'm gonna actually gonna pinch in all the way up here because then I'm gonna use this clay that's up here in the top portion and lay it out to make that uh, wide base for the the pillar candle, and I'll have an opening in the center for the uh, taper as I talked about. Now before I get this t uh, too small, right below that, I'm going to go ahead and lay this out and then I'll come back and uh, and push this in a little bit more. But now that I've got that shape there, what I'm going to do is take all this clay up here and kind of lay it out. I'm going to I'm gonna reach in there and then kind of pull back to lay that clay out to make the spot for the tape or for the pillar candle. I'm going to, my, my right hand is up underneath the cup, like right up under here, and then I'm pulling out over that with my other hand here. Uh, yes, you missed the Rebecca picture, Seth. Not doing it again either. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's right there. See? 
You missed it. Shouldn't go anywhere. It's like taking a bathroom break watching the Super Bowl. Can't do it, bud. You missed too much. All right, so there's that laid out. Uh, and now I'm gonna come back and, and, and pinch this in a bit more at the base. You wouldn't have to, but I'm... Uh... Alright, now what I'm going to do is I've got the spot there for the, the pillar candle to sit in. Um, I left my ruler up there. They're usually three inches wide and this is full, about four inside there. So that should shrink down to fit just fine. Uh, but then I want this inside. So i got to go inside with my index finger and kind of open this up right down here in the middle to make a spot for the uh, taper candle to go. So this is a bit of a tricky process to do a, a candle holder like this, but it is cool that it can hold both a, uh, a taper and a pillar. So that's very difficult for me to show you exactly everything I was doing on, on making that, but this is also something that used to make it at, uh, at Holly Hill Pottery, that first shop that I worked at, that I learned to make there, and something that I don't really care to make. <laughs> but now I'll move the camera so you can kind of see. Once you get up here, you can see that in the middle, it has a spot for the taper candle right in there and the pillar candle can sit above that hole in that spot there. <laughs> How on the flip do you not just lose that piece? Yes, I, it's called 30 years of practice. All right, let's see. Um, uh, da -da -da -da. Tapers about one inch, okay. <clears throat> yeah, do you have any tips for preventing wrist pain? Uh, yeah, because carpal tunnel is a thing. I mean, any repetitive motion you do with your hands is, is a risk of, of carpal tunnel. Um, I try to do as much as I can with my wrists as straight as possible. Obviously, when I'm centering, they can't be straight, but I, I, try not to, I try not to do much with my wrist, like completely, you know, push back like this. I just try to, um, you know, do as much as I can um, to use other parts of my body than just my wrist, kind of like when I was opening up the large flat pieces by using the heel of my hand pushing down. I think it's better than doing this in the, in the, and pulling out because then all the tendons that you're using that are part of your your fingers and all that pressure you're having to do. You do enough of that in pottery that if I can use the heel of my hand, it's a stronger part of my body. Um, uh, you know, thankfully I don't have much, if any, pain at all. Um, now granted, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm just be 45 this year, so I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to have had some pains if I, uh, for all the years that I've been making it, and I don't really, so that's great. Uh... <laughs> I think the top would just come up in my hands. Yeah, that would happen to a lot of people, uh, Pat. Don't worry. Um, 
espresso cup. That's just a really small cup, uh, Seth. <laughs> I could make one, but I'm just saying it. Uh, uh, I, I, I haven't gotten in the mode of making cups yet. Uh, maybe on another live stream, I'll make an espresso cup. Uh, espresso cups, do they have handles? I assume they do. Um, I don't drink espresso, but uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's just a really small cup with a handle. But... Uh, Am I going to Inseca? Uh No, I'm not. Um, mainly because every every year, Inseca happens the exact same weekend as a pottery show that I've been doing for years. Uh, it's always the fourth weekend in March. Uh, it's in Hickory, uh, North Carolina. And I have to be there Friday night, or Friday morning to set up. And the show is Friday night and Saturday. So uh, every year at the same time as Inseca. I am doing a show in Hickory, so I've I've yet to do, uh, I've yet to go to Inseca. Um, uh, I'm sure at some point maybe I will go, but if it's close enough, obviously Richmond is is close enough to me. Um, I was actually going to go to part of it in 2020, uh, and obviously that got canceled. So, but anyway, I was going to go for like the first part, like Wednesday night and Thursday, and then uh, and then come home. So. <clears throat> uh, do you, let's see, do you like to use paper clay? If so, what for? Uh, I have used paper clay to mend things before, like if things are, are uh, dry greenware or even I've mended uh, bisqueware before with paper clay uh, as far as like reattaching things that went, uh, had come apart, uh, just adding toilet paper to some slip. So I have done that before. A large mouth vase. Uh, that's that's a pretty easy one there, Seth. I can do that. Yeah, it's funny. I don't I don't make a lot of uh, wide mouth vases, but uh, talking to a local friend who does flower arrangements, she was like, "Why doesn't Why do no potters make vases with wide mouths? Because you can't put a you know an arrangement in in a lot of pottery vases because they have a, a smaller opening." But obviously, it just depends on on uh, what kind of look you're going for on a vase. But Uh, Renee, a moon jar. Yeah, I could do that. I love your twisted mugs. They're so fun to make. Uh, my first batch was a bit heavy, but I think I'm, uh, yeah, the, they're, they're, they're heavy. Uh, I, every twisted mug I've made is, uh, they're going to be heavy because you have all that extra clay that you're leaving in there when you do, uh, even though you're carving a bunch out, uh, it's really the only way to make them. I don't, I don't know if there was a way to make them and have them be really light. I do know one of the biggest tips I've learned on those is, is you, you really need to use a bit softer clay to get a really good twist in them. 
if you use stiffer clay, you don't get much of a twist. Um, All right, there's a, a somewhat of a wide mouth vase. For its size, I think that's a wide mouth. Let's see, that was probably about three pounds of clay. We got about eight and a half by the opening, or the, the total top is about five and a half. Not the lightest thing in the world, but. You stay so clean throwing. <laughs> yeah, Sherry, well, also something that I've learned over the years is I don't, I don't get really dirty. I don't, I, I used to use a lot of excess water. The first job I had in pottery, my first comment on my, like, kind of interview was, uh, I, I use, that I use a lot of water, but, um, learned over time not, not to use so much, but, um, uh, how wet or how much moisture do you like in your clay for throwing? Um, that's that's a tough uh, question to answer because it kind of depends on what I'm making. If I'm making something taller, I want a little bit stiffer clay. If I'm making something smaller like mugs or, uh, or something that's not challenging or doesn't need to stand up uh, really well, I'd rather have softer clay because then it's easier on my hands, uh, easier, easier to throw. Kind of going back to the question about carpal tunnel. Uh, when I can, I use soft clay so that uh, it puts less stress on my body. Uh, just try to be smart in that, stem, in that sense. Uh, somebody said, uh, Rebecca said, a one-piece lidded container. Yeah, I've, I've yet to really do that. Um, I mean, I could do it. Um, I just always find making them in two pieces is a bit easier. Um, Uh, you have a hard time with clay distribution when throwing bellied mugs. Uh, yeah, I mean, certain shapes make it a little bit harder to get the clay distribution right no matter what you're making, but yeah, I can see. We need uh, to have you come to Montana State University for a demo in ceramics. <laughs> well, Misty, I, uh, if I lived closer, I definitely would uh, consider it. Good little haul. That's uh, something I would like to eventually do. Do uh, more, I'm saying more uh, demonstrations and workshops. But with a young family, it's a bit difficult at the moment.
Uh, how do you know how thick the clay wall is? Is it purely experience? Yeah, Renee, I'd say that's probably mostly just experience. Um, just knowing how, knowing what it feels like. Um, also, with just the amount of clay you're using, you kind of get an idea of how big something should be or when I pick it up, I have a sense of the, the weight that it should be. <clears throat> this bat's a bit wobbly, so... Yeah, for the right price, I'll go about anywhere. Yes, Seth. <clears throat> I haven't had a lot of invitations to teach, work, teach workshops uh, in places, number one. And number two, the ones I have. <clears throat> um, it just, you know, you got to have the right... Uh, got to have the right price. You got to have the right conditions for it to work out. So, and things got to keep rolling here at home, so, between family and, and business here, so. All right, in making uh, something like a moon jar, I'm going to start by, even though I'm still pulling, I'm just going to kind of pull in a little bit of a rounded shape. <clears throat> I'm also trying to leave some excess clay in this top, say, third of what I've pulled so far so that when I go to taper that in, I don't have thin clay up here in this area. Because anytime you want to make anything with a, with a small opening at the top, <clears throat> you want to leave extra clay there so as you start to, to taper that in, that it doesn't buckle on you. Uh, that's the biggest challenge in throwing anything tall with a narrow neck, uh, or just throwing a narrow neck in general, is that you got to have clay there so it doesn't buckle when you do that. And you have to pull really consistently so that that doesn't buckle also um, so you don't have like a, a wobble there for it to buckle <clears throat> All right. so I'm gonna do another pull and I'm gonna pull kind of like out towards the belly and then back in at the top probably pull that a little bit more but with the uh, clay being a little soft and I'm gonna push it a little more I'm gonna stop there uh, I'm gonna just start uh, stretching now with just pushing out against my rib Do I throw one piece goblets or two piece? Uh, I don't throw any goblets right now, but uh, if when I did throw them, I threw them initially in two pieces and then learned to throw them in one piece, uh, which is quite the challenge and was quite the challenge even then after throwing for a long time, learning to throw them in one piece was not easy. So that's, uh, I do have a video on my YouTube channel about how to make a one piece goblet. So, um, if you want to go back and find that, I do have a video on that. Um, it is quite the challenge on, on how to make them, but it can be done. Uh, do you bis fire bis before wood firing? I do. Uh, it's it's really not necessary with wood firing because usually wood firing goes so slow uh, unless you have a fast fire wood kiln. Uh, but um, I uh, mainly do it because uh, I the way that I glaze, I'm really comfortable in the way that I'm glazing, and, and that's done on bisquare. Uh, 
applying different layers of, of, of slip and glaze, which is a lot harder to do on greenware. Uh, glazing greenware it presents quite a challenge because you usually have to glaze the greenware before it's completely dry. Um, your glazes have to be a lot thicker than normal glazes for bisqueware so that the glaze can sit on top of the, the, the wet clay and then kind of dry at the same rate and with the same shrinkage as your clay and not crack and fall off the pot as it's drying. So there, there's a lot of challenges with that. Obviously the, the challenge in time and energy that I put into bis firing is there, but uh, I'm just much more comfortable uh, glazing with bisqueware and I don't mind the extra time doing that and it helped me get the results that I want on the finished work. So. There we go, there's a, there's a moon jar. Uh, let's see, what else? Somebody said a teapot, um, a honeycomb shaped jar. Not sure what a uh, honeycomb shape. Uh, I guess, is that like a hexagon? <laughs> Do you know of any clays that are soft but are more heat resistant? Um, I don't know that those two necessarily always go together. Uh, by soft, I just mean clay that's soft when I'm throwing it. Um, heat resistant, you mean? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't get the question there. Um, let's see. Uh, hey Jed, welcome. Glacier pottery in in Montana. Have you ever been to Japan? I have not considered visiting. I would. There's trust me. Uh, there's lots of places I would love to visit and visit the pottery shops all over the world. Uh, just a matter of time and resources to do that. Uh, since you wood fire, do you have any clays that are less prone to cracking due to being more naturally heat resistant? Oh, okay, Sam, I got Asama, I got you. Uh, oh, less groggy, got you. Uh, yeah, there. Um, yeah, it's tough with uh, with clays that are not groggy and heat resistant. That is that is very true. That it is tough. Um, this, uh, the clay that I'm using is called Oakamedium. It's made here at Starworks um, in Seagrove, or in, in Star, just south of Seagrove. Um, they have some clays that are pretty smooth that are, that are heat resistant. One is, is their new Catawba clay. It's a clay that comes from Catawba County here in North Carolina. Um, but um, uh, <clears throat> Phoenix clay from High Water is pretty heat resistant and it's a pretty smooth clay. That one has done really well for a lot of people in wood firing. Uh, and I think maybe Zella Stone is another one that are pretty smooth. But any clay that's really smooth has going to have less of a heat. Uh, 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 can be fired to you know, can't be fired as hot as a clay that has a bunch of grog in it. So it's just kind of way it is. Uh, let it uh, honeycomb jars just have lots of rolls. Oh yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, that's. Um, yeah, we'll make one of those, Seth. That is a uh, that is also a shape that comes from kind of a J.B. Cole. Uh, well, I'm I'm sure it's not from them, but that's a shape that I've I saw uh, that they had made uh, in the kind of history of J.B. Cole pottery. Uh, before I make this, I'll get up and, and show you the. Uh, I found one of my old, or found one of my reprints of their old catalog from J.B. Cole pottery, and I'll show you that real quick and kind of show you what Seth is talking about, I believe. So this is a, uh, a reprint of a catalog that J.B. Cole Pottery made, uh, and I believe they made this in the... Let's see. This says, uh, price list is June 1st, 1940. 
And so, uh, and they have a price list here. The most expensive thing in this whole catalog is $7.50. <laughs> and that's for a piece that is, uh, let's see, that is for one of these giant pieces like that that was 34 inches tall, $7.50. <laughs> <laughs> so, pretty crazy. Um, but let me see. Uh, there's there's a Rebecca picture uh, in this catalog. That Rebecca picture is 36 inches tall. Um, so quite quite crazy that um, to have some things that big in a catalog that you could just order. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to look for that piece that uh, Seth is talking about. There's kind of, uh, is this what you're talking about, Seth? Right here, uh, it's kind of like a, uh, uh, a wide body and then it has these kind of like uh, concentric rings of, of, of uh, grooves in it. Um, I've seen pieces like that before and really actually like that shape and like that design to them. Uh, let's see, is there, are there any more of those back here? I don't know how many hundreds of items are in this catalog, but it's crazy to think that they had this many items that you could just order from um, in a catalog. There's the, uh, doesn't look too expertly made, but there's like a lasagna pan, kind of like that square dish I was making. These look pretty rough, but uh, that's kind of the idea there. Okay, Seth, that is what you're talking about, okay. Um, this was a reprint of, uh, somebody asked what this book was. This was a reprint of an old J.B. Cole catalog uh, from the 19, uh, from 1940. So it's, it's obviously not from 1940, but it, it's a reprint of an old catalog that was made back in 1940. There was uh, a picture of, of Nell uh, Cole Graves and J.B. Cole there um, in their younger days. This, is, uh, this was Nell Cole Graves when, when I knew her. Uh, she was in her 80s when I knew her, and she uh, threw pots for like 83 years of her life. So, born in 1908. I believe she passed away in like probably 96, 97. I can't remember now, but it's been a while. Anyway, um, but with your spin, sp spine on it. Okay, I'll put my spine on it, Seth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll take it for that price. Exactly. Uh, Andrew and I were looking at that book uh, the other day and did the calculations to, I don't know, Andrew did it somehow to how much that would be today. And I think that thirty, that $7.50 pot in today's dollars was only like, I don't know, like a couple hundred dollars or hundred and fifty dollars or something and I thought no I won't I won't even make something that big for that price I couldn't stay in business uh, and do it so yeah I knew you meant spin so I was just messing with you type spine a lot in your job. I got you. Uh, the live will be saved. Yes, all of my live streams go on my channel. Uh, if you go to my channel on YouTube um, and you may have to look along the top of my channel and click on lives. Uh, not just on videos. Uh, add lots of zeros. Yes, uh, Misty, exactly. Add lots of zeros. Well, maybe not lots, but if I was making a piece that big, uh, I don't know, it'd probably be at least $1,000. So add at least one zero. Probably more than that, more, more than 1000 but yes. I'm starting this similar to like a moon jar because I'm thinking that really wide belly. Um, 
<clears throat> shape. Oh, Salma, thank you so much for the uh, for the donation, and you're welcome for all the help. I really appreciate that. So there's the basic shape as far as what I had in my mind. Now we need to go and do those uh, do those grooves in it. Make it groovy. All right, and to do that without having it flop, that'll be interesting. <laughs> I'm practicing vases, and sometimes when I try collaring the neck, the clay doesn't want to be collared and uh, and narrow. Any tips for this? Yeah, uh, I know that's uh, I was talking about earlier about making sure that you leave clay, leave extra thickness in the top uh, when you're pulling. So I, when I'm going to make a uh, something with a skinny neck, I, I try to leave extra clay in the top so that as I collar, it doesn't want to buckle uh, as, as bad. So uh, let's see. I'm trying to think uh, how exactly to do this. I guess we'll start by that. That. Ooh. There we go. Woohoo. That looks pretty cool. Started to rip a little bit right there. All right, now I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna to torch this a little bit so that I can uh, do that, uh, so I can flute the top the way that, uh, that one in the catalog was. And I don't want the bottom to buckle when I do that fluting. So we're just gonna to torch this a little bit. Yeah, Seth, actually this is a piece I, um, one of my neighbors uh, um, passed away recently and, I, and they had a collection of a lot of J.B. Cole pottery and one of the pieces they had was something similar to this and it's a piece that I would have loved to have had but um, when they had kind of the estate sale I was in the middle of my last firing and didn't have time to go down there so Uh, any interest in throwing a big cappuccino type mug with a lid? Actually, uh, it's funny you say that, um, Amy. I have had on my li list for the last couple firings that I want to make some cups with lids. Um, but I haven't made them because I haven't exactly figured out what, it, what exactly I want to make or, or how, to, how to go about that and how large to make them. But it's something I've thought about. Um, 
when should you start selling pieces? I've been doing pottery for two years and I'm doing it like 15 hours a week and uh, the cost is killing me. I've never sold a piece. Yeah, um, well, uh, I'd say you sell something when somebody's willing to buy it, number one. Um, it's that's kind of hard to judge. You, you definitely need to be able to uh, make nice enough things that, that people do want to buy. Um, but then again, too, I've seen a lot of things that uh, uh, for sale that weren't the nicest pieces in the world and people still selling them. And it, I, I, I dare to say that still happens today <laughs> to a fair degree. So, um, yeah, if you're going to make pottery as a hobby, you're going to have to figure out how to get rid of some of it somehow, whether it's selling it or giving it away because uh, it starts to take up a lot of space. And also, it's not... It's not always super cheap to make pottery, so uh, let's see. I couldn't tell if that was falling in or if it was just uh, just the flute on it, but I'm going to torch it a little bit more right inside there just to help it. go that's pretty cool I like that I don't have to make more of those appreciate it Seth <laughs> I'm just making stuff that I know Seth will buy so Seth's like all right I asked you to make it now I gotta buy it <laughs> that's right <laughs> mm, so funny uh, uh, first super on live stream what was that oh uh, Sherry, thank you so much for the super chat as well. I really appreciate that. And that, I don't know if that was earlier than Sama's or since, but, uh, I just now saw it. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, you like that, Seth? All right. It's, it's, it's yours. I got to make some more though now. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, oh, there, I didn't scroll down. So, uh, yeah, oh, so Sherry, thank you so much, and that was after Satmas. I really appreciate that. Um, to make the rings, uh, what is the inside hand doing? I was basically just taking my, uh, my index finger and pushing out, and then I tried to push in between the two outside fingers, kind of like this. And then when I went to the one below it, I pushed a little bit more, kind of, I, I just pushed out and then had these two fingers kind of braced as well and then above it and so on and so forth. Just just trying to push out. Um, it was kind of risky because I knew as I got lower that was going to make it kind of start to wobble wobble even more. So um, I didn't do any of those grooves way down at the base. Just kind of like the middle one and one below that and then like two above it. So uh, let's see. A lot of my first pieces that I hated, and I know they were ugly, people loved. Yeah, Brad, that is very true. Uh, uh, yeah, Amy, uh, you can buy this in any hardware store. Basically, you can buy the, the, the tanks. Uh, this top torch you can buy all as one. It's uh, I bought this one because it has an automatic starting mechanism. When you push this button, it automatically lights it. And then once you get it lit, you can hold this down and let go of the trigger, and that will keep it on. And then you can just push the button to turn it off again. And then it has this knob on the back uh, to, to change how much it, 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 how hot it burns. So, and then you just buy these as a replacement. They screw on and off. Um, so, now apparently I, I've heard somebody saying they have these really cool torches you can put on the top that are more like my other torch, but go to a small tank. So I might look into getting one of those as well. I think Danny Meisinger, I saw him using one of those the other day. Um... Uh, oh, do I like it better than the huge heat gun? I do for smaller projects like that. Um, my large heat gun, I definitely use for large things. So, um, keep in mind that people who, uh, don't know anything about pottery, they find unique pieces very special and amazing because they can't buy. Yeah, yeah, that's true, Inez. Um, it's, uh, you know, we're very critical as the artists. We're critical of our own work way more than other people are going to be, uh, for the most part. 
and if people aren't used to buying pottery, you know, they might see something that's um, that's really unique, and even if it's not expertly made, it still could be something they love, so. <clears throat> um, oh, and you said that, even if we artists think they're not valuable. Exactly. Um, you'll take a royalty, Seth? Yeah, I hear you. I, I didn't see you over here making that. You just gave the idea. <laughs> Just messing with you. Um, uh, well, Camilo, that, that is totally up to you. If you don't think it's high enough quality, then that's up to you. I understand. You know, we all have our standards. Um, but uh, if, if, if it's a difference between selling items so that you can continue to do what you love and not selling items and struggling, then I would sell some stuff. Because if you want to keep doing what you love, there are people that will pay you money for the things that you've made that they do love, even if you don't love it. So, um, uh, Sherry, you're very welcome for the information. Uh, thank you again for the, for the donation, the super chat. Uh, have you calculated the cost of materials, glaze, clay firing uh, for individual pieces? Deep ashtray? No, <laughs> I am not that detailed. It would be a smart thing to do. Um, it, it would be very smart to do, but I, uh, I, I do this because I don't want to do things like that. That's the reason I make uh, art. Because <laughs> I'm not... I don't want to get into details like that. Anyway, uh, there are people that do, uh, for sure. <clears throat> Alright, been throwing for about a year and you have taught me so much. I uh, just want to say thanks. Jason, you're welcome. Glad I've helped. And uh, good luck going forward. Do you ever make pour-over coffee funnels? I have made a few. Um... I've made a a combo <clears throat> that's a like a teapot with a pour over thing that goes on top that you could uh, use as like a, a pour over set and then a serving set. Um, but they I didn't make a lot of them and they didn't really the ones I have didn't sell that quickly. I should make more. I just haven't. It's a lot of work going into them. Uh, what do you most enjoy throwing and what's your best earner if not too invasive? Thank you. Um, no, man, uh, I would say, geez, what do I enjoy throwing the most? That's a tough one. Um, I don't know. I just like being creative. Like what I just threw then, I really enjoyed that because it was something new. It's something new, but it's actually something really old, as we show, as we saw in this book. You know, that, that shape was around in the 40s. So, um, best earner. Um, I probably sell more coffee mugs as far as per item than anything. Uh, but I would say... For the clay in them, you know, probably like a face jug as far as the amount of clay in it and what I sell it for is really good. Platter bowls sell really well, yes. Um, so, <clears throat> have you ever done Raku? No, I haven't. I mean, I, since high school, no. I haven't. It's been a long time since I've done Raku. Um, my next sale, I have an in-person sale here, uh, the uh, like middle uh, to end, like three quarters of the way through April. I'm, I'm doing the show the end of March in Hickory. <clears throat> as far as an online sale, I don't have that scheduled yet. Last year I had one in February, but I don't have time to do that right now. So that's, that's a tough one. I'd love to have an online sale right now, but I just don't have time for it. <clears throat> Taking the time to make all of the, uh, to do all the photos and get everything listed, um, you know, just don't have time for that right now. So that's that's the tough part about online sales, uh, is trying to get all that uh, done. Sorry, I was trying to answer a text that my son sent. <clears throat> Stackable pieces of pottery. Yes, Seth, you got all the ideas, because, uh, I mean, not ones I haven't thought of, but I have a friend that wanted me to make a uh, salt and pepper, like, uh, like, you know, for kosher salt, and then uh, another thing with peppers, things that you could pinch the salt and pepper out of and have them stack so that the bottom one would be a container, the next one would be the lid for the bottom container, but then the top one would have a lid on it. It's definitely something I'd love to make, but it's I, I don't know how practical it would be. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> have I ever studied art or design? Um, just in school, just in high school, I didn't, I don't have any advanced education in art or design. Um, uh, 
All right, let's see. Um, maybe one more piece uh, while we're on live stream. Sugar jar with a lid and a spoon. Yeah, that's another thing to make, but <clears throat> also another thing that has a lot of... Some pieces like that have a lot of uh, time into them, and then they don't, you know, pan out to as much. Kind of like making, honestly, like making face mugs. I sell regular mugs for $35 without a face. If I put a face on a mug, uh, I might get $70 out of it. It's easier actually to make another mug than it is to put a face on a mug. So for that same $35, I could just make another mug rather than putting a face on a mug. So there's an idea of, of my thinking on that. Maybe it's just a big fruit bowl altered after throwing. <clears throat> um, the new jugs. Uh, yeah, I could do I could do a video on how I make the uh, how I do the cabin jugs. Is that what you're talking about, uh, Brad? All right, I got about. Uh, three pounds here. I think I might have another three over there I can put on top and we'll make something larger. Or actually, maybe just a... Uh, I think I have some twos over here or something like that. I'll add some clay on top. We'll make it a little bit bigger. make a large fruit bowl here we'll I should have probably picked a round bat instead of a square one but that's all right we'll we'll make it work we're gonna do something a little bit taller than a uh, a little bit taller than a platter bowl, but kind of a similar design. Kind of a wide bowl, a little bit more on the shallow side. Scott, uh, what do I sell the most of? You must have just got here. I think I just finished saying that I, I probably sold coffee mugs more than, than about any single piece. Um, it's probably the most commonly used handmade pottery item, I would say. Welcome, by the way. Um, and good, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, one of my ancestors owned the Rhodes Pottery in the Edgefield District of South Carolina. Oh, yeah. Hello from Hawaii. Leone, welcome. Uh, all 
Yeah, Seth wants a thick-walled tumbler so he can drink his coffee out of a tumbler. Yeah, I, I got you, bud. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna reverse the wheel to do a little bit of the shaping from the inside on this one. Thanks with the lid, yeah. <laughs> There, I got the inside nice and smooth with that rib on the inside, throwing in reverse there. Uh, let me put a swirl on the bottom. And let's see, what are we going to do with the, the rim of this? lay that over just a little bit <clears throat> as far as altering afterwards let's see let me grab uh I'm gonna use my rib here and I'm actually just gonna do some grooves. Uh, try to go straight up and down. I'm gonna to try to do four of them. I got the four corners of the bat to kind of go off of. Um, It's not a whole lot of altering, but it's a little bit. Uh, you can kind of see there. I should give some neat spots for the glaze to kind of run down and alter the rim just a little bit. Yeah, there you go. You see the profile there. It's got just a little bit of ribs there on the outside. Well, uh, there's lots of other suggestions. Uh, let's see. Oh, flute it. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did do a little bit of those little bitty flutes, but I'll, maybe I'll come back and add a little bit more to it later. Um, uh, have you ever made a mortar and pestle? No, uh, I have not. Uh, yeah, it would probably hurt me to throw that thick. <laughs> uh, let's see. What other questions we got here? Um, Shaping the inner curve, throwing in reverse. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, Amy, you can actually check out, I have a YouTube video on throwing in reverse where I talk about why I throw that way. So you can check that out. 
Um, it's actually called Throwing in Reverse. Um, so, hey, buddy, welcome. Sorry if you're just getting here. I'm 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 just about to finish up. So, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Brad, that definitely uh, helps uh, compress into uh, shape from the inside like that. Uh, let's see. Um, in pottery for me, my sister and I want to come to North Carolina to see some of the great potteries. Is there a best time of year? Um, Gwen, really, if you want to come for the weather, definitely come in spring or fall. Uh, it's a great time. Uh, potteries here are open year round. Uh, I would say stay away from January. January, some of them do close, but the rest of the year, yeah, definitely. Um, but best time of year for weather would be, um, like probably April, May, and then like, uh, October, November, there's great times of year as far as the weather goes. So, um, your wheel doesn't reverse. Oh, Eve, sorry to hear that. <laughs> yeah, definitely, uh, yeah, a wheel, uh, that goes in reverse is nice. Uh, but if it doesn't, you can, uh, you know, you, you can work with, uh, doing it with your dominant hand. You just have to work on the inside, like right here in front of you like this to do the shaping like that. It's just a lot easier to do it like this. And if, but you have to reverse the wheel. So, so anyway, uh, I hope you guys are doing, I hope you guys had a, a good time and thank you all for your support on the, uh, YouTube channel and everywhere else. Um, I'll keep you, try to keep you all updated on, uh, firing. Uh, I'll be doing some more live streams. I've got a couple more weeks before we, uh, load the kiln. So I'll try to keep you all updated. Uh, and then maybe the next live stream we'll do, um, maybe do a face jug, maybe do a cabin jug on the live stream. Cause that'd be a lot easier than trying to make a video at this point. So, um, yep. Anyway, thank you guys for being here and I'm going to go eat some dinner. So you guys have a good night. And we'll see you soon. And if you're just showing up, like, buddy, <laughs> you can go back and watch the replay. Sorry about that. Um, next time, I will try to... I did schedule it ahead of time. It just didn't work out because uh, I didn't hit to make it public. So, anyway, you guys have a great uh, rest of your day. And we'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye.